Good morning, everybody. And um, according to the polling, I get to introduce one of the hot sessions. 48% want to hear about research and clinical trials. So um, this is the session we're starting on the clinical trials that are restoring or replacing dystrophin. We're not doing the gene therapies. These are a clump of mostly exon skipping drugs. So um, I, without further ado, I'm going to call the first speakers up. And speakers, why don't you come up and then stay up here um, after your presentation, because we'll do Q&A at the end. So we have NS Farmer, and that's NS Pharma. That's Dr. Paula Clemens and Dr. Hirofi Komaki. So welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hirofi Komaki, National Center of Neuropsychiatry, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, with uh, great uh, collaboration uh, between the U.S. and the Japan, uh, we have gotten a paper result. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, present our data of top line re result of uh, this drug. Uh, first of all, I, I present a brief int introduction of this drug and uh, uh, present a data of uh, Japanese phase one clinical trial result. And next. Uh, Dr. Paul Kremes, uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, will sh show you the uh, result of North American phase one, phase two trial. Our National Center of Neurology Psychiatry and Nippon Senior Corporation are co inventors of NSS65 and CMP01. Uh, and uh, these are our disclosure. National Center of Neurology and Psychiatry are located in Tokyo, Japan. It's a leading medical center of research and care for muscular disease in Japan. It's also a sponsor of a festival study of this drug in Japan. Nippon Senior Corporation, uh, its headquarters is uh, located in Kyoto, and Japan-based uh, pharmaceutical company, uh, and the sponsor of phase one, two study in Japan. NS Farmer, uh, located in New Jersey, or uh, its wholly owned U.S. subsidiary of Nippon Shinya Corporation. It's also sp sponsor of his two study in North America. Our uh, NSS 065 and CFP 01 originated from Nippon Shinya jointly with uh, National Center of Neurology Psychiatry. Uh, it's also have the mechanism of exon 53 skipping. Our uh, uh, characteristics are around here. Uh, high potential of, uh, of exon 53 skipping activity. It's made of PMO, also known as uh, morpholino, and uh, charge neutral. It's required to, uh, intravenous administration once weekly. Uh, it's excreted through the kidney. Uh, it's overview of exon skipping strategy. Uh, it's an example of exon 48 to uh, 52 deletion. Uh, it's a result in a disrupt or reading frame, uh, resulting in the uh, pro production of abnormal protein. Uh, exon skipping uh, by NSA 065 and CFP01 uh, restore the reading, reading frame and uh, result in partly but uh, functional destroying protein. Uh, it's an uh, overview of NS065 and CFP01 clinical problem. Uh, we uh, initiated phase one, uh, investigated initiated study uh, at uh, 2013. Uh, it's a uh, dose escalation study for 12 weeks. Uh, all this result already uh, published in a uh, journal of uh, science traditional medicine uh, this, week, this spring. Uh, uh, this study showed that uh, uh, this drug was favorable up to 20 mg per kilogram, and uh, uh, this drug in product, protein uh, production uh, in high dose group. Uh, after that, uh, Nippon Shinya Corporation uh, conducted phase one to those finding study in Japan. Uh, no stu uh, North American study will represent after that. Uh, it's, uh, 
phase one study and those final study in Japan. Uh, primary primary ob objectives are all here, uh, distorting expression by emissive chemistry and Western bot, and also observe the exon skipping level by RTPCR. Secondary objectives are physical function, CK levels, safety, and pharmacokinetics. Uh, key inclusion criteria are age from 5 to 17 years, amenable to exon 53 skipping, and uh, ambient and non-ambient boys are, are recruited. Timing of mass biopsy are all patients at baseline, and four patients at each dose caught at 12 weeks after at 12, 10, 4 weeks. It's a phase one to explore open label study. 16 patients are enrolled in this study, and half of a uh, patient are assigned for 40 mg per kilogram, and 80 mg, uh, another eight patients are enrolled uh, assigned for 80 mg per kilogram. Uh, it, all patients are administered uh, 24, for 24 weeks. Uh, it's uh, over with safety data. There are no A's uh, leading to discontinuation. All A's are mild or moderate. Uh, one serious adverse event, uh, SA, or observed, but upper uh, respiratory uh, tract infection was not treatment unrelated. It's a fair safety data. It's a result of Western blotting. Uh, Result: Our uh, episodes of 12 or 30 folks a week. Our uh, results show that statistical significant increase in the stroking level from baseline was confirmed at 80 million per kilogram cohort. Among them, 80 million per kilogram for 12 four weeks had a better uh, result. Uh, mean range, uh, mean bar was 48 percent. Exon skipping level by RTSPCR has showed all 16 patients demonstrate a high increase in uh, exon 53 skipping level at 12 or 24 weeks. Uh, level of exon 53 skipping was though dependent manner. Level of exon 53 skipping was higher at 12 four weeks than 12 weeks at both those levels. Yeah, let's move on to that. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna show you a few slides uh, from the North American study. So, uh, as Dr. Komaki said, the, um, the uh, uh, study in Japan and the study in North America went on in parallel. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> do I correct that? It just takes them, it'll come back. I didn't push it yet, but. Okay. Um, there um, were uh, some differences between the different study designs. Um, and uh, so Dr. Komaki has presented the, the Japanese study, and I will um, present uh, the North American study. Um, and the high-level results, and then uh, at the end, I'll kind of try and pull it together and give you a little bit of a comparison between uh, the two studies. Okay, so um, so for the uh, the study, and this is all of the introduction that you've just heard uh, is relevant because it's the same investigational drug product uh, that was tested in both studies. Um, so what, I, what I'm going to show you is uh, in blue there. Um, so the primary outcomes of this study that I'll report on are the safety and tolerability, and also the muscle dystrophin by uh, expression by Western blot. Um, and then I will also show you some of the secondary outcomes of looking at the, at the muscle dystrophin expression. So let me just uh, walk you through the study design. If you start on the left-hand side of that schematic, uh, participants came into the study, went through screening and randomization, uh, and there was an initial cohort 
that receive 40 milligrams per kilogram during a, an, an initial four-week period. Two of them were randomized in a blinded fashion, two, two of the eight to uh, uh, receive placebo just for that first four weeks. And after the first four weeks, then all participants were on the study drug until the end of the study uh, at week 24. And uh, to meet the uh, primary objectives, uh, there were muscle biopsies done at the beginning of the study before any drug treatment and at 24 weeks. After the first cohort uh, of eight participants went through, the second cohort was started, and that was at the uh, higher dose of 80 milligrams per kilogram. And again, uh, two of the, of the eight participants uh, were randomized to uh, the placebo for the first four weeks, uh, followed by the next 20 weeks when everyone was receiving drug product. Um, all uh, participants have um, uh, now uh, moved into a, an extension study in their same dose cohort. So if you look below the schematic, uh, there, uh, it gives uh, kind of the, the high points of um, the participants in the study. So they were four to less than 10 years of age at, at entry. They were ambulant. And of course, they needed to have a mutation that was amenable to uh, exon 53 skipping. There were 16 participants, eight in each dose cohort, enrolled at uh, six synergy sites in the US and Canada. Uh, the first participant was enrolled in December of 2016, and last patient, last visit uh, was in March of 2018 for the 24-week uh, study. So similar to the Japanese study, there really were no safety concerns um, through, throughout this study. Uh, just about a week ago, there was an SAE, but it was a... Uh, a uh, situation where a child uh, jumped off a jungle gym and, and fell and, and uh, had a, a leg fracture, uh, so it's not a treatment-related um, uh, uh, adverse event. Um, no, um, uh, none of the adverse events have led to, to uh, discontinuation of, of the drug. So this is the uh, average uh, dystrophin expression um, at both the 40 milligram per kilogram and the 80 milligram per kilogram dose cohorts. Uh, so um, what you can see there is that the, uh, the level of expression is, is similar between the two groups uh, in, um, in, in this uh, study. Um, but you'll also see that the ranges are, uh, are different. And just below that, I'm going to show you kind of a graph, uh, and just to orient you to the graph, uh, each uh, red dot is a participant in the study. Um, those uh, the overlying the, the orange bar were in the lower dose group, and those overlying the, the uh, green bar were in the higher dose group. And what you're looking at is the increase in dystrophin protein from their baseline. So what you can see is that there is some spread. Um, and uh, there are different levels of dystrophin that in, in different participants, um, despite the fact that they received the same, uh, the same drug treatment. So I know um, um, most of you probably aren't uh, familiar with, uh, with uh, Western blot uh, data and looking at the gels, but I thought it was actually useful for you to see this because Clearly, the doing uh, muscle biopsies in these kind of studies are really critical, um, but they are, are clearly a, a significant um, um, contributor of the participants themselves to go through this process. Uh, and so it's really important for you to know that, that uh, a lot of work has gone on in the community to develop really good and robust validated methods of of analyzing muscle dystrophin, and, and uh, these methods have um, had FDA review. Um, and uh, um, you know, I'm really happy to say that in this study, the uh, um, the um, the Western blot uh, analysis was done extremely well. So they're done in triplicate. They're done at blinded assay as blinded assays. Uh, 
for this study, it was done by a, um, a small company called Agata um, Biopharma and was led by, by Eric Hoffman, who you're gonna actually hear from later this morning with another study. Um, the, uh, essentially, muscle is, uh, an extract is made of the muscle, it's run out on a gel, and then it's transferred to a membrane. And as you all know, dystrophin is this huge protein, so it is not trivial to, um, to do this technically. Um, but what you can see there are the, um, the dystrophin bands, um, and to the right you see uh, of, of the gel, you can see the, where you see um, the upper bands, those are, that's the truncated dystrophin that's, ex that's restored in the um, ones that are not baseline. Obviously at baseline, the dystrophin expression is, is absent. Uh, on the left-hand side of the gel, you see the, 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 a standard curve, which is made by um, making very specified mixes of normal muscle extract with Duchenne muscle extract so that you're loading the same amount of protein on the gel, which is shown by those lower set of bands, which are all the same all the way across. And what those lower bands allow us to do in the, in the blue and the black band right above it is to make sure that the protein loading is the same across so that, that you're actually measuring um, that in a valid way. So just very briefly, uh, there was uh, the um, skipping can also be measured. Uh, so that's the, uh, the correction or the, the restoration of the reading frame of the message that is then going to produce the protein. And you can see here the skipping levels of 17.4 of for the lower dose group and 43.9% uh, skipping uh, for the higher dose group. These, uh, uh, what, what um, immunohistochemistry can show you is that the dystrophin is going to the proper place uh, in the membrane. So just to um, bring the, the, uh, the two studies together, um, when we're looking at this, the expression of dystrophin from this intervention, we look at it both from the standpoint of the skipping of, of exon 53 in, in the gene message, uh, as well as the, the dystrophin protein. Um, and what we saw was that, that there was a dose-dependent response for both exon skipping and dystrophin protein in the Japanese study. We saw a similar dose-dependent response in the North American study for skipping, uh, but we, uh, the mean dystrophin expression seemed uh, similar. Um, now, there were some differences between the two studies, uh, which you may have picked up along the way. They had a little bit different age ranges. Um, there was some differences in the timing of the post-treatment biopsy, where all the North American biopsies were done at 24 weeks, and uh, Jap the J Japanese study did half at 12 weeks, half at 24. And there were were different proportions of the exon 53 amenable deletions. So finally, uh, just in summary, uh, both studies have demonstrated exon skipping, which shows that there's target engagement of the morpholino intervention with the dystrophin message. And uh, both studies are showing uh, restoration of truncated dystrophin in the patient muscle. And there have been no safety signals, and the pharmacokinetics, which I haven't shown you, have been uh, completely stable and expected. Clinical endpoints were collected in both of these studies, and those are um, uh, under analysis, and uh, those will be available uh, later this year. So finally, I just want to acknowledge uh, the uh, members of, of that contributed to this on, on the left-hand side is the North American contributors. On the right, it's the Japanese. You can see the, the site investigators who are each leading teams at their site. Um, the, all of the work with the muscle biopsies was done by Agato Biosciences and uh, led by uh, Eric Hoffman, who also has um, made major contributions to uh, the entire program. Um, the project management has been done by uh, TRINS, uh, which is a um, neuromuscular-focused CRO led by Lauren Morganroth. Um, Shinichi Takeda uh, was one of the original inventors of, uh, of this um, and developers uh, of, um, of the Morpholino and 
really has a, a career-long contribution to Duchenne research. And the sponsors are Nippon Shinyaku and their US affiliate, NS Pharma. So thank you very much. Those are some great results, thanks. That's really um, very encouraging. And in the interest of time, I know we all have questions, but I think we're gonna go through the presentations and then we can do questions at the end. Um, so next we have Wave Life Sciences and there's a little change from your programs. We actually are lucky enough to have the CEO of the company, Paul Bolno here, so I'd like to welcome him. Thank you, and, and Wendy would have been just, just as great, so we're, we're, we're excited to be here, and, and good morning. Oh, we have to wait. Um, while we're waiting for this to get up, I'd just like to thank Pat and PPMD for giving us the opportunity today. It's great to be up here around uh, companies who are so committed to the space. Um, and to share with you an update on where we are, both with our current clinical program, but also important as a company, an update on our science. Just for an administrative perspective, because we are going to do some corporate updates, um, we will be making forward-looking statements during this discussion. So please um, refer to our SEC filings for updates. Um, but first and foremost, I think it's important for those of you who aren't familiar with WAVE to just give you a, a general background and really share with you our journey. Our journey has been, and it's hard to believe, um, next year, 10 years, where we've been working on transforming nucleic acid and oligonucleotide chemistry both from a manufacturing standpoint, but also from a drug discovery standpoint. And what that journey has allowed us to do in going from mixtures of hundreds of thousands of drugs to single drugs is to focus on building a portfolio of rationally designed, stereopure oligonucleotide therapeutics. Now we talk and we'll spend more time today talking about the exon skipping formats, but what's so unique about the platform has really been our opportunity to work across modalities. So what I like to refer to as kind of a genetic medicines toolbox. We've been able to build a multimodal approach of either in the case of diseases where having a protein is undesirable, turning that off, and in the cases we'll go into with um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, being able to turn a, a protein on. Because with this toolbox you can go into so many different therapeutic areas, we had made the decision to focus our research efforts on neurology and with an emphasis on neuromuscular rare diseases. We currently have in the clinic now, and we'll go into a bunch of depth as we go forward, but just we have currently now have three clinical programs underway. Our two programs for Huntington's disease initiated last year, and our Exxon 51 program initiated last year as well. We'll be advancing our DMD Exxon 53 program early next year. And we continue to have active research underway in a variety of neuromuscular diseases, including other Exxon deletions. One important piece, in addition to drug discovery capability and development, is the investment we've made as a company very early on in manufacturing. And we currently have our own GMP clinical facility and are continuing to meet its scale-up requirements as our programs move forward. All right. So we are building an extensive portfolio across neurology, both in um, CNS indications as well as neuromuscular diseases, and you'll see um, multiple under neuromuscular diseases. And at the end, we'll go into some of our work that's happening in that space. But we spent a lot of time talking about oligonucleotide therapeutics, and I thought it'd just be helpful to kind of step back and say, you know, how do you build an oligo? You know, what is an oligo? And when we think about an oligo in general, um, you can think about it as a series of letters. You have these nucleotide, these bases that are letters, and you have to put them together. And nature has a way of doing this. The problem is when nature puts these letters together, they're not very stable. So what, what smart minds have done is they put different chemistries together to attach these nucleotides together. And we know these names, whether it's morpholino, or what we call PMO, we have phosphorothioates, or what we call PS. And all that means is these are just the chemistries that are available to attach these bases together. Now, when you attach these bases together using traditional manufacturing, what you end up doing is creating a left hand and right hand. That's called chirality. And anybody who, who wants to, if you put your hands together and then you put your hands on top of each other, you'll notice that your thumbs stick out on opposite directions. And if you picture that on the backbone of a drug, what you've now done is change the dimensions and how that drug looks. And that random orientation, what we've seen, has different stability, has different potencies, has different safety signals. And so the recognition that within these mixtures of hundreds of thousands of drugs exists different pharmacology. 
So what we focused on at WAVE is reducing that down to one single well-characterized medicine. By controlling how that backbone chemistry and how those bases get put together, we can develop and ascertain one drug, such that the same drug that we test in vitro is the same drug we put in vivo, it's the same drug we run in our toxicology studies and becomes the same drug we ultimately take forward into clinical studies. So how do we do that? And that's really been the work that's been done over the last 10 years in understanding where you put different chemistries on the backbone to change pharmacology. At the end of the day in this class, we can start with a target sequence we like. We know in, this, in these areas of genetically defined diseases, it's really important to pick a good target sequence. So we have the ability to start with the target sequence we like. We can then think about what we want to do. Again, reach into that toolbox and say, do we want to turn it off? Do we want to turn it on? That lets us work across antisense, RNAi, and importantly, in the case of DMD exon skipping. By being able to control that, we're now in a position to think about how does one want to control the stability of the drug? How do we want to increase the potency or activity of the drug? How do we want to take down the immunogenicity of the drug and ultimately dial in specificity? All of these pieces sounds like a lot to go from target sequence to optimization. To let you know, we'll have two more clinical trial initiations in the fourth quarter for ALS and frontal temporal dementia. We're now on a timeline of only 15 months from the time we pick a target sequence to the time we have an optimized um, stereopure medicine that we would take forward. And what you see at the bottom, and you can see how that kind of We'll call it left, left, right, but in the case of looking at the, the diagram, you'll see it as up down. What you can see is that these molecules take on a shape. And what's unique about this is that we have this unique opportunity to design a unique drug. So as we transition to talking about exon skipping, what we're talking about is the ability to have a uniquely designed exon skipping format. So how do we take a uniquely designed exon skipping format forward? The goal for us was to think about making a, a potential medicine that has a variety of different aspects. As we said before, you want a drug that's going to get to where it needs to go. We know the heart's important. We know the diaphragm's important. We know skeletal muscle's important. You want the drug to be stable and able to turn on a, a lot of protein. Equally important, you want it to be safe. And so these are the components that we put forward as we're designing the program that we took forward into the clinic. Now, we'll be using words, and you heard some of them actually in the last talk, and I think it's just important as we use these words that we, uh, we, we focus on the importance of them. So the first word is transcript. So the goal of an exon skipping format is to turn on a transcript. And what I think about a transcript is it's, it's words on the page, right? It's the instructions for making the protein. And at the end, you have a protein. And so we'll measure these through different assays. Proteins, we'll often talk about Western blot. And when we talk about transcript, you talk about PCR. So right now, we'll transition from the platform to really talking about our exon skipping format, our current investigational compound, 210201, our exon 51 skipping program. When we started in the exon 51 space, we asked ourselves a really important question, which was, could we generate what's called a dose response? And what you're looking at right now, this is measuring transcript. And so we wanted to see, on the left is a measurement of that transcript. The higher you go, the more transcripts created. And on the bottom is how much drug you're giving. In blue is our, our investigational compound. We compared that to a stereorandom PMO, or morpholino background, and we compared that to a stereorandom phosphorothioate. And what we want to see is that as you give more drug, could you turn on more transcript? Hence, that blue line is that you move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. As you give more drug, you generate more transcript. Now, transcript's important, but not to the exclusion of protein. So the next transition for us was Western blot. Could we measure that? Could that increase in transcript yield an increase in protein? So if you look on the bottom right-hand side, what you see at the top are those same dose intervals of the transcript, right? As you give more, do you see more? And what you see along that top band is as we give more drug, not only do we see more transcript, but importantly, we see more protein. We chose a 10 micromolar dose to compare that to the existing stereorandom PMO, as well as the stereorandom phosphorothioate. So this is the 10 micromolar. And what's important is both of these studies were done on patient-derived cells. So these are muscle cells in a dish. And so we'll say this is an in vitro study of 51. And we see that as an important piece in optimizing a program for exon 51 amenable deletions in exon 51 cells. So at the 10 micromolar dose, 210201, the investigational compound, saw 52% protein production. We were pretty 
excited about moving this forward, and this is the data that drove us to move the program forward into the clinic. We also are a research-driven company, and so one of the questions that came up early on, because this doesn't have a cell-penetrating protein on the backbone, we're not delivering it um, through any delivery mechanisms, this is just the naked oligo. So as a research-driven company, one of the questions that our scientists were focused on while we were moving into development on the early side was really answering a question of why. Why were we seeing more skipping? And by being able to go back and look early, and again, some of the advantages of having a single drug is you can really look and try to ascertain why is that drug doing that? And what we could see right away, and in this cell, you're looking at this, another cell in a dish. The blue is the nuclei of the cell. The red is actually a stain that we've developed for oligo, is that you could see that the oligo itself, this exon skipping format, was actually not just getting into the cell, and that's important, but most importantly, getting into the nucleus. And the nucleus is the part of the cell where splicing occurs. So very important to see that drug gets to where it needs to go, generates a transcript, and that transcript generates a protein. Now, we also know that you need to distribute. You need to get to different tissues. We know the heart is very important in addition to skeletal muscle and diaphragm. So we did do a non-human primate study to look at the distribution of drug. And what we saw was drug gets to heart, diaphragm, and skeletal muscle. Now, the normal healthy human primate generates its own protein because it's a healthy animal. So you can measure this transcript, but you can't measure the production of protein. So we felt it was also important to develop a methodology to test this in vivo to look at the production of protein in an animal. So what we did was we looked, the, the curve on your left is the same curve you saw earlier, the dose titration as you give more drug, you see more transcript. What we did was we created a surrogate for the MDX23 animal, saying could we develop an MDX23 oligo that had the same skipping efficiency, the same transcript production as our 51 clinical program. Hence the dark green dot at 10 micromolar and the dark blue dot, the 10 micromolar dose that you saw in the western blot of protein. So we were able to take this surrogate compound now into the MDX mouse and be able to look at could we translate this protein production that we saw in vitro into an in vivo model. And what we've seen very recently, and this, this is very recent, this is a Western blot data graph. On the left is a standard curve where we can look at the dose. As you learned in the previous slide, the bottom are the two controls to make sure the well loading is, is similar. And what we could see in the MDX mouse is a 70 to 90% production of natural functional dystrophin after only four doses. So this was single dose IV, so thinking about our current clinical compounds dosing regimen, single dose, four doses, so one month of therapy, and then looking at the amount of protein production. So again, this is without conjugates. This is just looking at the natural ability of the drug to distribute, get into the cell, and to turn on protein. So obviously, we were pretty excited. This reaffirmed for us what we had already anticipated based on our Exxon 51 in vitro data. Now, protein's important. It's very important to make a lot of protein, but we're also working on making an investigational drug to be a potential medicine. And therefore, safety is as important as making protein. So what we looked at in this construct was whether or not the drug, if it's not getting into the cell and having the ability to turn on protein, is the drug not building up in the tissues where you don't want it? Is it not building up in the kidney? Is it not building up in the liver? And what we could see is by day eight, in blue, you're looking at our investigational compound, 210201, and in black, dries a person. And this speaks to our ability when we say we generate a unique drug. We're not generating a drug that looks or acts like drugs that have been developed before. What we can see is that our drug is not accumulating in the kidney. This is very important as we think about doses going forward and as our program advances. So this continues to give us um, a lot of enthusiasm for the study. To now transition and talk a little bit about now about our investigational study we're currently running. Um, it's a phase one clinical study. We're running, it's global. It's randomized placebo control, and it was interesting to, to look at some of the survey results. So we are running a placebo controlled study. Um, it is a single ascending dose study, so after a single dose, those patients can then have an opportunity to move into an open label extension. So the other question of having access to drug is something that is contemplated in this clinical trial design. From enrollment, we have listened to you as a community. So as we were building this clinical trial, a lot went into our assessment of clinical trial design on the iterations from the beginning to what got us into the current clinical trial. 
We're allowing a broad age range, so ages 5 to 18, who are amenable to Exxon 51 skipping. We are allowing ambulatory and non-ambulatory patients into the study. Now, another thing we heard from the community and we paid attention to was the ability to have a washout protocol for etepleurcin and adalorin. So we are allowing patients who had been previously treated with etepleurcin as well as adalorin into the study. However, we are not allowing patients who had prior exposure to drizoperson. Patients must be stable on a steroid regimen. So we anticipate the full safety data from this study to read out Q3 of this year, so not too far away. Um, and we will be then moving forward also and giving updates around the open label extension. So what's next for the program? So next for the program is we're continuing our listening tour on what the um, efficacy study would look like following this in protocol design. We are talking to regulators as well as the community. Then design what we are, where we are is a double-blind placebo-controlled multi-dose study. We will be assessing dystrophin as well as clinical outcomes in that study. We'll be measuring dystrophin via standard Western blot. There will be an interim analysis in that study of dystrophin expression by muscle biopsy. And we do expect an efficacy data readout um, second half of 2019 from that study. So where else are we progressing? As we said, this was Exxon 51 amenable patients, but we are committed to the space. We have our Exxon 53 skipping program that's moving right behind it. One of the advantages of the platform is we can take the next sequence and apply a similar chemistry onto that sequence. So the ability to move from one exon to the other and to take our learnings from one and apply it to the next program is something that we can continue to build. To that end, we're currently seeing similar data with our new 53 programs as we saw with 51, so that's affirming for us as we transition from one program to the next. But we also did some additional data because with our 53 program and our learnings around skipping and asking the question, how quickly does the skipping machinery take place? We started to look at um, 24 hours after we dosed the 53 compound in the MDX mouse, how quickly could we see that drug transition into the nuclei of cells. So within 24 hours, what you're looking at here is a cross-section of muscle cells. Those blue dots are again the nuclei, and the red dots are again drug. And what you can see is already within 24 hours, drugs sitting inside the cytoplasm of the cell that's within that black space, and importantly, inside that blue space, so sitting inside the nuclei of the cell. So again, a lot of the learnings that we've applied from our 51 program, we're able to pull forward and apply to 53. We remain committed beyond going through 51 and 53. And early part of this year, um, we did a research collaboration with a company called Deep Genomics. It was a pretty exciting company we saw that was probably at the forefront of machine learning and artificial intelligence as it related to sequences. And they had experience with additional neuromuscular diseases, which gave us more confidence on their ability to pull sequences forward. And so we're working with them across neuromuscular disease and then deep within DMD to continue to find ways of pulling together sequences that already preferentially may be, may be better to work with. And so we're using that to accelerate our discovery efforts, not just on the chemistry side, but on the biology side of pulling additional exons forward. Ultimately, um, we have you to thank. The commitment of the community in helping inform our decision making um, has, has been so uh, helpful to us. Um, the many of you who've come by WAVE and visited our team, um, it, it changes people. And so it's important for us to make sure you know that as we go forward, both on the clinical trial, but also in the research discovery phase, we will put you first, we will listen, and we will adapt to that listening into our clinical studies. But most importantly, we'll continue to move forward with urgency. So thank you very much. Thanks, that was a great talk. And hopefully next year at this conference, we'll be seeing some uh, dystrophin results. So that would be exciting. So next we have Sarept with Therapeutics, um, also Exxon Skipping, and we have Doug Ingram, the CEO. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. It truly is an honor to spend time with you this morning. And uh, it's a particular honor to be here at the PPMD conference. I know this has been said before by others, but the kind of work that PPMD does for this community and that Pat Furlong does for this community is amazing. I think everyone knows we had some very exciting preliminary results in gene therapy. Hopefully everybody also knows that one of the early 
uh, funders and believers and investors in Jerry Mendel's work around microdystrophin was Pat Furlong and PPMD. So it is particularly poignant that I have the opportunity to talk today uh, at a PPMD conference. So thank you very much. The second thing I want to say is that I have a very challenging concept. So as all of you may know, uh, Tuesday before last, about 10 days ago, um, we had an R&D day and we talked not only about our gene therapy, but all of our programs. And it was about seven hours and I'm going to do the same thing in about 15 minutes. So apologize in advance for the fact that it'll be somewhat superficial. And of course, I hope everyone knows, I will leave the actual results on the gene therapy program to Dr. Mendel, who will be speaking next. This is our forward-looking statement. Obviously, we'll be talking about um, the possible things that will occur in the future, and there are risks associated with that. I also will give you a very personalized forward-looking statement, which is this. People tell me that I am an extraordinarily enthusiastic human being, and I don't want that to come across as over-promising. We have a ton to do. We have a big goal, we're ambitious, we want to do a lot for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but it is tough and we're going to fight for it. Hopefully, one of the things that I will show you today is that we have a multi-platform approach. We are going to attack this disease in every way we can find uh, to do, and, I, and hopefully you'll come away with that as well. This is our goal and it is an ambitious one. We want to develop life-changing precision genetic medicine to treat, if at all possible, 100% of individuals with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And what do we mean by that? We mean in, along the journey, we want to have therapies that increasingly become more profound in the way they benefit those living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and constrained only by the science to get to as close as 100% of those um, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy as is possible. And that's at least our ambitious, ambition and certainly the approach we're taking. We've done a lot over the last 12 months to put ourselves in a position to try to fulfill at least some of that goal. The first thing we did about 12 months ago is become more ambitious as an organization and as a people. We transformed our pipeline. We have actually 21 development programs right now, 16 of them focused on bringing a better life to those living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we, we changed our culture to really begin to accelerate things with a sense of urgency that matches the urgency that you have. The second thing we did is go out and get the, the fuel, get the resources to actually fund that pipeline. It's fine to have a pipeline that fills a page, but it means very little if you can't actually do the work on it and have the, the resources to do that. And the good news is we do right now. We're not limited in that regard. The third thing we did is bolstered our infrastructure. So we went and got more lab space, and we went and got more facilities in Andover and Cambridge. And then as you'll begin to hear over time, we've developed a, a gene therapy center of excellence in Columbus, Ohio, and we've got extraordinary people there, and we'll be con continue to build that. And then, this is very important, we're attracting really smart people. Okay, every day we're hiring right now about one and a half people a day, each one of them sharing that vision of bringing a better life through therapies to those who are living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So that should give you some, some, at least some hope and confidence. These are scientists and developers and regulatory people and pharmacovigilance people, and I could go on and on. So we're getting a lot of good people to help us in this mission. And we're getting a lot of really good talent of people that really know what they're doing. I'd like to, to just mention two of them, and I, I am bragging a little bit, but, but it's on behalf of some people that, that I'm really excited about right now. So at the next session, you're going to hear about Dr. Jerry Mendel's work. Dr. Jerry Mendel is at Nationwide Children's Hospital. He's done an enormous amount of good for a, for a lot of people through gene therapy and neuromuscular disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and before that, SMA, and he has a protege, and his protege for the last 15 years is Dr. Luis Rodino Klepek. And, and what we need with gene therapy are really smart people who know what they're doing. And Luis has been Dr. Mendel's protege for 15 years. She's associated with 11 trials in gene therapy. She's taken six programs from the bench into clinical development, and she has an extraordinary passion for what she's doing. So I'm really proud to say that she is now our head of gene therapy. And I'm also, um, relieved to know that Dr. Mendel isn't extraordinarily angry about this. So that's obviously a positive as well. Uh, he's still talking to me. He actually was, was willing to sit down with me last night. So I know he's on the right side. I actually think he's quite excited that he, he knows that 
as the program transitions to, to uh, Sarepta from Nationwide Children's Hospital, with Dr. Luis uh, Rodino Claypuck on board, we're not going to screw it up. And I think that probably gives them a lot of confidence as well. And then also we have Dr. Gilmore O'Neill with us. He's here in the audience today. <clears throat> Dr. Gilmore O'Neill shares this passion. He is a neuromuscular expert. He was actually the head of all late stage development at Biogen as well. So he is gonna drive all of our development programs, including our gene therapy programs forward. So I mentioned before that we are gonna take a platform approach and we've taken a platform approach to attacking Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And here you'll see we have 16 programs. We're, we have, we're RNA, we, have, we are the pioneers in the use of RNA and exon skipping to treat Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We have three gene therapy programs. We have a gene editing program with Dr. Gersbach over at Duke. And frankly, you'll see this additional approaches. That is a simple marker to say that we are not afraid to look at anything that could bring a better life to those with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We're not gonna put blinders on. Another thing you would have seen at our R&D day, um, if you had been present for it, was that we share something else. We're very ambitious as a people, but we are not um, arrogant. We are humble. We will be successful not because of the things we do, but because of the fact that we have associated ourselves with the world's luminaries who are coming up with wonderful ideas and ways to treat Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You will see this in the, literally in the very next program. Uh, Dr. Mendel is in the next program. I believe Dr. Flanagan, who has a gene therapy program that we, we have as well in the next program. I'm staring down at Dr. McDonald here, who's done a lot of extraordinary work with, with Sarepta as well. So, our success will come from the fact that with a great deal of humility, we are just gonna search for the smartest people and mine the ideas that'll help, help folks. Let's talk really briefly about our RNA technology, and I have to be somewhat brief because we have a lot of candidates. The first thing to know is that we focus on exon skipping in our RNA uh, technology. I, I'm sure most of you have heard of this concept before, but we use this thing called an oligo, a PMO, as you heard before, to essentially hide the, an exon from the machinery, skip it, put an in-frame uh, messenger RNA in place and allow the, the uh, messenger RNA to actually make a truncated but functional form of dystrophin, and we have a lot of programs around that. Our, our current programs are so-called uh, PMOs, and that includes uh, Exondus 51, otherwise known as the Teplersin. The Teplersin is for Exon 51 amenable um, patients, about 13%, as you know, of the DMD community, and it's approved in the United State right, States right now. Behind that, we have Golodersin, which is Exxon 53 amenable, and behind that, we have Casimirsin, which is Exxon 45 amenable. Patients will be uh, submitting for, hopefully, for an approval. We'll see once the FDA uh, reviews the file at the end of this year for Golodersin, and then right behind that, if the data looks good, we'll file for Casimirsin as well. There are two things to know about the PMO technology. One is that it's very precise. We literally make this in a bespoke way to, to precisely skip the exon that we're looking to skip. And, and at the cellular level, when it gets to the right place, it, it reliably creates that skipping and creates dystrophin. And the second great thing about it, it is very safe. It has an extraordinarily good safety profile. There is a limitation to the PMOs, generally speaking, and that is because they are neutrally charged they don't get into the cell in a very abundant way. So while they can do a lot of good, there are limitations to them, and we want to reduce those limitations and increase the efficiency of our PMOs over time. And that gets us to what we call the PPMO. The, the second P is peptide, because we have a, this so-called peptide conjugated PMO concept where we use this peptide essentially as a carrier that will drag the PMO into the cell in greater abundance. And, the, and, and if we're successful in this, and I will tell you we're, we're at the very beginning stages of our first clinical trial with patients there, if we're successful, uh, at least the animal models would predict that we could get a therapy that may be as much as 10 times or more effective even than our PMO technology. So um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of the preclinical data that gets us excited. Remember that forward-looking statement I said at the beginning, these are animal models, okay? Animal models have a certain ability to predict things but we won't know with precision what we have until we have it in patients and we see what therapeutic doses look like. So please take that into consideration. But at least you can understand why we're putting such a big bet on PPMO because the, at least the animal data gives us a lot of excitement. 
Here you can see with our first uh, program, which is the PPMO 51. It's essentially Exondus 51 or a Teplerson with this peptide conjugated to it. What you can see is if we get to significant therapeutic doses, we get very significant exon skipping, nearly 100% in some of the muscles. The next slide that you can see, and this is a, mice, a, a, a mouse model, you can see that as we get to the higher doses, and what, what you're seeing here is this. On the far left, in that purple bar, that's a mouse that doesn't have a Duchenne muscular dystrophy. All on the right is the, are, are mice with um, muscular dystrophy. The first one in yellow is an untreated mouse. And as you can see in a very dose-dependent way, as we're able to dose higher and higher with the PPMO, we get a very significant restoration of function. In fact, at very high doses, we get, at least in a mouse model, please understand that, almost full restoration of function in, in the mice. So you can at least see why we're so very excited about it. Now, as I said before, these are animal models, but the great news is we're now in patients. So we have our first study. It's what's called a single ascending dose study in patients right now for PPMO 5051. And I'll make a little, here's my little advertisement for everyone, <clears throat> for those who may be amenable to exon skipping for, for 51. We are recruiting for this single ascending dose study, so you should talk to your physician about that, and you can find resources on our website about that as well. This describes the first study. The short answer here is it's about a 14-week uh, process. It's a single dose study. However, when you complete the single dose, you have the option, if you choose, we certainly would, would hope people would choose to enter into an extension study where you will actually start accelerating in dose along with others. So you can immediately roll, enroll in a long-term study where you can get therapy matching the, the dose as we escalate the dose. So there's an opportunity for that as well. So that's our 50-51. Now that's our first sequence. But I want to show you our second sequence, 50-53, and you'll, you'll see why we're excited about really moving with um, a high degree of exigency across our entire PPMO program. 50-53, so this is the same sequence as our Golodersin PMO, which we'll be submitting for at the end of this year, but with a peptide conjugated to it. And again, as you can see here, when we get to good doses, we get extraordinarily high exon skipping, which obviously um, would result in high expressions of, of uh, dystrophin as well, hopefully. And so as a result of that, we really are trying to move as fast as science will permit us and regulation will permit us to bring these therapies forward. I talked on the yellow uh, area, I talked about the fact that we're already in the clinic with patients, with uh, Exxon 51 amenable patients. We have five additional um, exons that we're getting ready to put into the clinic now. There's pre-work that has to be done. We'll have a study kicking off for 53 before the end of this year, right at the end of this year. In the first quarter of next year, we'll have a study with 45. And as fast as we can beyond that, we'll begin to roll out over the coming quarters, 50, 52, 45, et cetera. Now, as you may recall, at the early slide, I said our goal was to get to as close to 100% of patients living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy as is possible. If you take these six programs, that's 43% of patients. That is a far cry from 100%. Uh, on the far left, you'll see this thing that we call the rare exon platform. So what we have to do if we're gonna start to get to rarer and rarer exons, and that is our goal. Our goal is not to make some sort of economic decision that would eliminate um, folks that could actually benefit from exon skipping, but that have extremely rare exons. Our goal is to get to as, as many patients as the science will allow us to do, and that will require dialogue with the FDA. We're already in the process of setting up that meeting for this year, so we can begin to talk to the FDA about the ability to get a platform approach, and we can actually sequence far greater than this 43 percent um, and, our, and our goal is to have a productive discussion with the FDA about that going forward. And hopefully by next year we can have a, an update on that. We'll see where we are with that. But the good news is the FDA seems very amenable to having at least that dialogue with us. So it's the beginning of a process. So I am not going to give the data on our gene therapy, but I will very briefly give you a discussion about our approach to gene therapy. Um, and our approach, again, is one of humility. So why we're excited about gene therapy 
is not because of our own brilliance, but because of our ability to associate with those who are brilliant around the world. You're going to hear from Dr. Mendel, and you're going to hear from Dr. Flanagan in just a moment. Both are from Nationwide Children's Hospital. We have an extraordinarily good working relationship with Nationwide Children's Hospital, which has really become not only the pioneer, but the leaders around the world right now in the potential use of a genetic medicine and gene therapy to treat neuromuscular diseases. We also have a great relationship with Genethon, uh, um, which is the microdystrophin program that's a bit behind our nationwide program. So our goal, again, is to, to, to continue to leverage smart people to find solutions that, um, that will benefit the Duchenne muscular dystrophy community. I'll give a very quick primer on where we are with our construct in our first microdystrophin program with Nationwide Children's Hospital. And the good news is that Jerry Mandel will be coming up after me, so I will not spend a lot of time um, in any depth here because I'm, I'm out of my depth with it. But real briefly, this is the why, why some of the reasons we're so excited about our uh, gene therapy approach, and it's because the, the entire program as developed by Dr. Jerry Mandel and Dr. Luis Rodino Klepek is in a very real sense elegant. The first thing is to pick a, the right viral vector. We're very excited about the viral vector that we have. This is RH74. The vector is another word for this capsid that's a carrier. You put everything inside of it and it brings it into the uh, cell. And the goal is to get it into the right cells. RH74 gets into the right cells. One of the hypotheses in choosing RH74 was that because it comes not from human, humans, but originally from rhesus monkeys, that it might actually have a lower um, neutralizing antibody screen out rate. So what's that about? If you've been exposed to some viral vector in the past, then you will screen out and be unable to participate in a gene therapy that's using a particular vector. Our hope and goal was that through using R874, there might be a lower screen out rate. And it appears, at least uh, as of now, that that is the case. As Dr. Mandel will mention, we have less than a 15% screen out rate for neutralizing antibodies, which is, from our perspective, a very good rate. We'll talk in the future about how one might get to 100%, but we're not there uh, scientifically today. So it's good to, to have picked a capsid that appears to have a very low screen out rate and will be available to the vast majority of patients. The second thing about R874 is that it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier in any kind of promiscuous way. So it appears to stay where it's supposed to be, which is skeletal muscle and the heart. <clears throat> the next thing you have with gene therapy is the so-called promoter. So you have this thing inside of it, and it's your gene construct, and you attach to it this thing called the promoter. The promoter essentially tells the gene when to turn on. So if it goes to, to the wrong cell, it doesn't turn on. If it goes to the right cell, it begins to make the protein that you want, in this case, obviously, dystrophin, microdystrophin. Um, and the great news about our promoter is that it, it goes to the right places. It, 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 as you'll see from the preliminary results, shows great expression of microdystrophin in skeletal muscle. But more than that, in the animal models, it overexpresses in the heart. So we actually, at least according to the animal models, should see even more expression in the heart than you'll see in the skeletal muscle. So we're excited about that. And finally, the microdystrophin gene itself, which is this edited down version of, of the gene, it was elegantly uh, and very empirically uh, formulated. It was first based, it started based on a case study that occurred back in the 80s. It's a 61-year-old uh, Becker. A patient who was 61 years old and still walking, and lo and behold, that person had a form of, um, of, uh, of microdystrophin, where, where most of the repeats in the middle had been edited out. One of the things that Dr. Mandel and Luis Rodino Klepek did was to try to hew as close to that as possible. There was some additional editing that was required to make sure it fit into a capsid, but they were really trying to be very careful not to to change as much as possible to avoid changing things that obviously worked naturally. And such was also the case about keeping the order of things as close to the natural dystrophin gene as possible. So our view, at least, is we have a very good, elegant approach to gene therapy. And Dr. Mandel, of course, will provide you with the empirical data that we have preliminary, though it is, though it still is. So where are we going from here? So I want to be very careful, again, forward-looking statement. We have discussions that need to take place with the FDA in the context of the therapy that we currently have. Our goal right now is a 24-patient study, randomized, placebo-controlled study to try to move as fast, as fast as possible to have a therapy with the right data, not only to get approved um, and available to patients 
in the United States, but around the world as close to simultaneous as possible. But as I said before, before we begin to execute on this plan, we really have to sit down with the FDA and take additional input from them to ensure that we're aligned together on the approach. And we will all obviously along the way begin to have conversations with other ministries of health in other countries around the world. Because again, our goal is not to serve a subset of patients, but to serve as close to 100% of patients around the world as the science and regulations will permit us to do. A shout out for duchenne.com slash connect. If you want to get additional updates along the way, along this journey, you can uh, take this down. You'll probably find this also on our website and you can look to that, that place and we'll continue as, as, um, as we're permitted to do to provide as, uh, transparent updates as we're moving forward with all of our programs. Um, and with that, just a special thanks for um, for all of the patients and families who have the, the, the willingness and courage, and there really is a courage with, a, with not just a burden, with a lot of these therapies for patients and their families to participate in trials. It means a lot. It doesn't mean just a, a lot for Sarebden. It doesn't mean just a lot for you, but you're doing an extraordinary um, thing for other families in the future and now who live with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And again, thank you to, to PPMD, and, and thank you all. Thank, thank you very much. That's incredible progress, really. Um, our next speaker is Michelle Avery from Summit Therapeutics. And I just want to take a moment here to really recognize how brave it is that she's here. So drug development is not for the faint of heart, someone once told me. It's unpredictable. It's heartbreaking. If you were here for my little talk last night, it can be heartbreaking. And I think that Michelle is really demonstrating her leadership and her commitment and her partnership with the Shen community, even given the circumstances. So thank you very much. All right. Um, would it be possible to get the very last slide projected? I'm not going to go through this presentation, obviously, uh, but my contact information is on the last slide. So be great. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone, um, and, and thanks to PPMD for inviting us here. Um, for the first time in my life, I've had to script myself, and that's just so I can hopefully make my thoughts coherent. Um, so I know that we had all hoped that I'd be standing here to present positive data on our eutropin program. But as I'm, I'm sure that you're all aware, we announced incredibly disappointing results from our phase-out DMD clinical trial on Wednesday. To say that we were shocked would be an understatement, particularly given the encouraging results that we had seen after just 24 weeks of treatment. Some of you have asked why that we didn't notify the investigators of the families involved prior to this announcement. The reason for this is we are compelled by law as a public company to broadly and promptly announce the disheartening news in a single announcement, as much as we would have loved to have shared this news ahead of time with the patients, families, and researchers whose participation and commitment made the study possible. After the public announcement, we immediately notified phase out DMD investigators and patient organizations as we were prohibited from directly contacting the participants of our trial. Our hope was to disseminate the news to study patients and their families as quickly as we possibly could through these known and trusted sources. Inevitably, however, some of these families learned of the news secondhand at different times and from less personal sources, including social media or news stories. For any of phase-out DFD patients, families, and loved ones who learned about our clinical trial results in such a jarring and impersonal way, all of us at Summit deeply regret that you had to have this experience. Now that we've covered that, I'd like to share a little bit about the clinical trial results that drove our decision to, continue, or to discontinue the development of Azutramed. While it is an easy, an easy decision to stop the development of a drug candidate that we all believed would be able to treat all patients with, DM, with DMD, Phase out DMD gave us a very clear answer. There was no benefit for patients taking azutramid across primary and secondary endpoints at the, the 48-week time point. We were able to compare some of these measures to natural history at 48 weeks, but the results showed no differences between those on azutramid and the natural history. These measures included the magnetic resonance measures of fat fraction or the accumulation of fat in the muscle and inflammation. These also included measures of function, the six-minute walk distance and timed function tests. 
In biopsies, we compared muscle damage to each patient's own baseline, and there was no difference after 48 weeks of treatment, although we had seen a significant difference after 24 weeks in that measure. Phase-out DMD answered the very important scientific question of whether azutramid could slow the progression of DMD in patients, and we have definitively answered that it cannot. We are eternally grateful for the participation of the families in phase-out DMD. Each patient and family member played an important role in advancing Duchenne research through their participation. And to this end, we plan to explore how the information gathered as part of the trial could be made available to other DMD researchers to help benefit the entire community. Even though you may feel discouraged by these results today, we believe there's a lot of promising research on the horizon as you're hearing about at this conference, and reason to have high hopes for the future of Duchenne. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, our last speaker of the day, is, or the morning, is Stu Peltz from PTC. Uh, thank you. So, um, what, you know, um, what I thought what we would do today is just give you uh, an update of, of where we are in Translarna, just give you, as, you, as m many of you know, we've, um, it's for the treatment of genetic, of, not of, of Duchenne Nazis mutations. We'll tell you where we're at within our commercial activities around the world and then where we are with the FDA and then ongoing clinical studies. And then we'll tell you also a little bit about update on Inflaza and, and just start thinking about this. So um, again, it's, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. We've, uh, I don't know exactly how many we've done, but we've been at most of these reports. And this just shows you um, the really 20 year history of the company. We just recently celebrated our 20th anniversary. And I think we're proud of that because um, for a company to go from an idea to bringing something to patients commercially is quite a feat and uh, rarely done by the group that was there. So I think it's quite exciting. And you, you sort of hear, you know, but it is sort of a long period in order to get that done and that it requires uh, substantial endurance, effort, resources, um, grit and determination to, to, to bring this. It's a hard thing to do, you, you just heard that. It's, you know, uh, the, it's interesting when you look at from an idea to a commercial product, it's, there's probably about a 5% success rate. So we all know it's difficult, but it's so worth doing, and that's why you see so many people continuing to do this. Um, and so let me just tell you a little bit about Translarna. Translarna, well, it's not available yet in the United States. We have it available in 47 countries worldwide, about 90% of the nonsense mutation boys in the EU5 are on uh, Adaloran. The, um, we've got a renewal for that uh, from Translarda recently. And we recently just got um, the first ever really, uh, not, it's expanding the label so that children, uh, boys between two and five year olds are able to get that. So that was a, a, a a significant important expansion and we'll be, we, we completed that trial that allowed the CHP to uh, expand and approve that aspect. So we're quite excited about that and continue to monitor the, the boys and the patients and other patients uh, around the world will be getting it. Um, in terms of the US, we, as you probably know, we've been working hard to bring Translarna to the United States. Um, and We've, we filed a dispute resolution, and while not successful yet to bring it in, I think it was a really important event that happened because it defined very clearly our capabilities of what exactly we need to do in order to get it approved. And in discussions with Dr. Woodcock and then uh, a subsequent, what we need is will be along with the clinical data that we currently have, um, which she thought was quite positive, she wanted us from a regulatory perspective to do a dystrophin study. So, um, and so we're, we're doing that. We anticipate initiating that uh, by the end of this year. We will then um, have the results that should be, that trial should then be completed by the end of next year for filing uh, either by the end of next year or early in the, uh, the subsequent year. 
So we've been working hard on that. And we've been talking with the FDA in terms of the, what the trial design will be and what is the best assay to use that we're going to be validated. So we've been working hard in validating assays. So stay tuned with that. That will be initiated early and we're going to go as rapidly as we can uh, to complete that. Um, we also have a second trial that's also in the United States for uh, Translarna. This is uh, a trial is broken up into two ways. I think this is going to be very interesting in terms of learning considerable amount of information from both uh, uh, DMD uh, patients that are both younger and older. Uh, it's, a, what, it's been done in two ways. We're going to have patients will, for the first 72 weeks, uh, be either in placebo treated or in at a translarna treated for the first 72 weeks. They then will be crossed over for those patients who are on placebo to again get translarna for the second half of that. You, so patients who are still on, who took translarna in the first half of the experiment will remain on it, while patients who are on uh, placebo for the first part of the trial would then transition on the translarna and that they will be continued to be monitored subsequent to that, such that at the end of that period we'll then compare the findings for um, the findings for what the trial looked like in both parts of that. So we think this is going to be a very interesting trial that will uh, define not only the benefits early on but also the longer term benefits of patients, of, of what Translarna does for patients, both younger patients as well as older patients. So again, um, there's a number of criteria for meeting in, into this. There's a number of US sites uh, that are open and are available. We're showing you here um, that you need to walk at least 150 meters to be able to perform some time function tests. Um, and then the mo I think one of the more important parts is you must be on corticosteroids. And it's very clear now that you have to be on uh, the corticosteroids are really now part of the standard of care. Uh, and that uh, you could see the care considerations have really, uh, uh, over a number of different studies, have shown that uh, being on corticosteroids, uh, you pay the DMD patients do far better than not being on it. And I think also it was very clear that um, we, the benefits of teflazacord even over prednisone. And so what you could see here, it preserved, um, when we look at the results and what was reported, that we saw there were preservation of functional milestones. Boys showed less loss of, 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 of walking in the time, as measured in the time function test, as well as in the six minute walk test. They, uh, lost, they delayed in loss of ambulation had less weight gain uh, when to flazacort, uh, less uh, scoliosis, improvement of pulmonary function, and per, uh, lived, uh, had actually longer lives as a consequence of that. And then, uh, so you could see, and, and I've heard this a number of times, that, oh, it's a steroid, it's a steroid. And this shows you the difference between prednisone and deflazacort. And you could see, um, they look pretty similar, but their differences are in a, what we call the south, uh, the northeastern part of the molecule. You can see small differences. But it's actually really important to know that small differences can have profound effects on the drug's activity. And I'll give you an example of that. Here's a drug that maybe some of you know. It was called thalidomide. And there's two forms of this, R and S. And you can see by looking at it, they look about the same. The only difference is, is the angle of one of the bonds. In this case, it would be almost above the ground. This one would be almost below the ground. That small difference, however, is pretty substantial in its difference. You can almost look at it like, here's a car. Now, we're used to driving on the left side. The, the other side is the, the UK side. That's, in a sense, the difference of that molecule. That, so it looks almost the same, but it's actually quite different. And it turned out, and this is probably one of the reasons the FDA is so powerful, is that it turned out that one of the molecules caused developmental defects, and many of you may remember this in the 60s, caused substantial problems, whereas the other one was an effective sedative. So it does show you that very small differences 
can have quite profound effects on, on what, the, what a drug activity can be. And so I think this underscores that. And so when you think about uh, the differences between inflaz or deflazacord, it's now become relatively clear that there are substantial differences in both the efficacy and, second, and side effects as a consequence of that. Uh, and this says it's more potent as an anti-inflammatory agent. It, it has lower mineral corticoid impact uh, and longer duration of action. And there's now a bunch of papers that substantiate that fact. Um, if you look at the uh, placebo-controlled trial that was used to, for the approval, it was actually, in this one, it was really quite cl clear that when you looked at muscle strength over time, that you saw improvements of strength of inflaza over deflazacord. They maintained strength longer. They also gained less weight, absolutely substantial amount of weight. They also had less side effects. So when one thinks about the benefit risks and why the FDA approved this is because of the benefits that we saw in deflazacord or in flaza. It isn't only that data also. There was a recent uh, synergy database results comparing uh, deflazacord and flaza versus uh, prednisone. And uh, it was from the natural database. This is one of the largest uh, natural history studies that were performed. It's looking over 10 years. Um, so it really is a substantial body of data demonstrating and looking at the difference with a substantial number of the Shen patients within this trial. And it was very clear when you look at the functional milestones uh, that are important, when you look at the comparison of inflaza over uh, uh, over prednisone, you can see being able to get up from the ground, being able to go upstairs, the loss of ambulation, to be able to have reach. Patients who were on deflazacort or inflaza did better. And we're not talking about small differences, we're talking about years of difference. So it was very clear that this was a, a product that was uh, better and, and should be used as standard of care, at least in our view. Similarly, if you look at the work that, we, uh, that, was, that we've done from our ACT-DMD study, and this was a, a large, looking at the placebo control of well over 100 boys, when we looked at the C, how did they do in terms of loss of walking, their ability to do the six minute walk test, and all the other sort of time functions test. Now this is a, a, an example of a graph, and it's, it's easy to look at if it's, to the right, it's in favor of deflazacord. If it's to the left, it's in favor of prednisone. And what you could see in all of the tests, when you compared deflazacord or inflaza to prednisone, you could see that again, it did better, substantially better. If you look, for instance, not only in the six minute walk test, but uh, where 31 meter improvement, loss of ambulation in this was uh, a four, almost a four year difference. So very substantial difference between inflaza and uh, prednisone. So um, that's, I think, um, and I guess my real appeal is that I think all kids should be on standard of care, which means I think the, all Duchenne patients should be on a steroid because I think it's important to them. And we'd argue that, that inflaza, the data demonstrates that there was substantial improvement. Um, the other point is we recently also talked with the FDA, where we now have a plan to conduct an additional study for two to five year olds, um, so that we'll be able to bring the label, to expand the label to those patients who are under five years of age. So we're trying to expand the label for that as well. This, this trial um, is being worked out and will be anticipated to be started with this year, I think, um, to, continue on and with, uh, to do that. So you can see here, there'll be a 20 week period followed by an extension period where we'll be monitoring initially two doses that then uh, in the extension study, we'll go to one dose following that uh, based on the results. So we're excited about, uh, again, being able to expand the label uh, for this, I think, very important drug. So, um, I think one of the other advantages of being able to not only have the largest database of patients 
who are being treated with a drug with uh, Inflaza and also looking at Translarna around the world. We're trying to do a lot of work to uh, age of diagnosis. And you know, clearly there are signs and symptoms that patients see you know, very early in life, but by the time they're diagnosed, it's a considerable odyssey. And so to be able to get patients earlier is really critical. So we're really trying to uh, really uh, push uh, uh, disease awareness and diagnosis so that uh, the Shen patients more early become uh, diagnosed and conceive of the appropriate treatments that occur. So we're working hard on that. Uh, we're, as I said, we're continuing to work on the benefits for patients both uh, non-ambulatory as well as in the two to five year olds uh, and trying to give as much resources for patients to gain access, and I'll talk a moment about that here, where uh, we have a large number of patient services to help you uh, get educated on Inflaza and help you through the process of being able to obtain Inflaza for the DMD patients. We also have built a, a very strong uh, group to help with patient financial services, because our goal is really to minimize, to bring down to almost nothing uh, what out-of-pocket costs for patients. And we've been working hard to make that, sure that happens, regardless whether it's you're on uh, private or public insurance plans, uh, we have means to help you. And even if you don't have insurance, we have plans uh, to, not only plans, we have ways to help you uh, be able to obtain this as well. So uh, there's, a, there's a, a number of um, people we have here from, uh, uh, from PTC today who be happy to discuss any issues that you may have uh, or need any help. Uh, you can stop by and see the team. They're here to answer any questions that you have. Um, this is just a call out for uh, some new websites and that's been revamped and worked on for both uh, uh, Inflaza and PTC Cares. So these, uh, if you have any, if you don't get a chance to go back and talk to people, um, you can look at these websites and we hope that'd be helpful to you as well. So um, let me thank you for this 20-year uh, partnership. I, it's, it's always fun to come back and see people we've seen from uh, almost 20 years ago. And just, you know, I also look and, and marvel at how, how well, I know um, sometimes it looks when we're in the weeds how things seem slow, but from my perspective of being in this field for 20 years and watching what it was when we started this and working with Pat and the PPMD and the, all of you here and where it is today is, I think, quite remarkable. And so uh, I think everyone here is to be applauded for uh, the efforts that were made and how much progress that has been done really as a, a consequence of um, the community, the whole ecosystem being capable of saying, you know, we're not going to just wait and see what happens. We're going to get in front of this and work at it. So really congratulations for everything that's going on. And I thank you for your time. So we are actually running a little bit ahead of time, um, and this is our time now for questions and answers for these panelists right here. So for anybody, if you have questions, you can approach the microphones, and I believe that these microphones work um, to answer questions, so please, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone uh, for sharing information and all the work that you do. Uh, so uh, my question is uh, regarding Exxon skipping. Uh, I'm happy that many boys now have options to benefit from these approaches, in some case multiple options. My boy, like uh, he, his mutation is not typical and uh, none of the current or planned approaches uh, uh, you know, apply to him. So my question is, uh, like, uh, I, I believe Mr. Ingram touched upon this, but maybe he can, exp he or others can expand on that. Is like, as families of uh, boys with not so typical mutations, uh, can we keep a realistic hope uh, to benefit from exon skipping? In some cases, it is a, like a single rare mutation. In in some cases, it is 
uh, that you know duplication where selective skipping needs to happen. In some cases, it is that multiple exons need to be skipped. And it's a two-part question. So if the answer to that first question is yes, then how do you go? How do you envision the approval process to go through? Because I believe, uh, you know, uh, for some of the mutations, it might be even hard to find enough boys to do a 100, 200 patient trial. So how do you see the approval process to go through? So I, I can start that. Can you? So, so a couple thoughts. One, you know, um, exon skipping. I've, you know, the numbers, you know, float around, but. But exon skipping um, can benefit perhaps 85 to even higher than 85 percent of, of patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the, the first six that we're focusing on with the PPMO, as I said, are 43. And that's because if you're going to do a traditional development program, do animal tox work, do sequencing animal tox work, get an IND file, et cetera, et cetera, you know, it, it, the, the percentage drop off dramatically after that first six. It gets down to 4 percent. It drops off dramatically. So what do we do? The one answer is we stop at 43%. That is not the right answer because we can do it. We have the capacity for that 85 to 89% to sequence and help those patients, okay? Regardless of how rare that particular mutation is, the, to get from here to there is a regulatory issue. How do we, from a regulatory perspective, yeah find ourselves in a position where if we can sequence it, we can find a way to make it available, and then we can find the patients, not for a clinical trial, but to actually begin to benefit them. And that's the, you know, the short answer is there, is there is at least in the regulations today in 21st Century Cures Act, for instance, there is a good basis, a regulatory basis for that dialogue. So it is not insane to imagine we can find a pathway, and I'm at least you know, happy to say that the FDA is very willing to engage in the dialogue. The ultimate goal, then, is this, and I'm, again, I will go back to the, my personal forward-looking statement. There's a lot of speculation in what I'm about to say, but if we can get some data, let's say, for instance, with our PPMO, if we can get some data from our first couple of trials, at least from a safety perspective, doesn't even have to be from an efficacy perspective, perhaps, and then the basis for that would be, you see this, this, this is a, a platform. The, you know, it's essentially the same therapies. We simply use, we, we take the four letters and we put them in different sequences in a bespoke way to deal with particular mutations and then get the FDA to develop confidence over, you know, over real empirical evidence. That's gonna be one of the requirements we have. Get some real empirical evidence to get to a point where we say, we have a platform approach so long as we do some basic um, you know, preclinical work on sequencing, and we can prove that it does what it's supposed to do with a particular mutation. Let us get that out onto the to the community and begin to treat patients with that, and then perhaps put them in a registry and follow them over time. So that's the hope. That's the goal. A platform approach. The it is not it is not you know while there's a lot of you know surmising and speculation what I what I'm saying, I can at least tell you that we're not standing still. We are actually in the process of, of putting together a meeting, and the FDA has been very willing to have this meeting on that exact topic so we can really figure out exactly what it will take to get to that platform concept. So, you know, do I think that there's a lot of um, work that has to be done? Yes. Can I tell you that it's a certainty we're going to get there? No. Can I tell you that you shouldn't be giving up on, on exon skipping merely because you have an extraordinarily rare exon that is amenable to exon skipping? The answer is do not give up on that because we're not giving up on it. So we share that. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. So I think we share Doug's enthusiasm and forward-looking statements on the ability to be able to take advantage of 21st century cures as it's written to say, how do you bring additional exons on after you get an approval and data around a sequence? But I think separately from that, on the research side, we have examples now where we've worked with patients, patients' families, in terms of accessing muscle cells, where we have worked on starting not waiting until we get approvals and some of the other exons to start bringing those forward, but actually a big impetus around our Deep Genomics collaboration was exactly that. How can we interrogate the new deletions or even the potential of multiple deletions that need to be skipped in a machine learning context to be able to identify new um, exon skipping formats where we can take our chemistry and apply it there. So we have been, have been working in that space and you know, we're always happy to look at the more complex deletions to be able to see how we can accelerate moving formats forward. Thank you. 
was also, I, I think the guys made the right point that we never know which one, which therapy is ultimately gonna work. But I think what, 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 what we do know is what standard of care is. And we do, what we do know is that not everybody is at standard of care. And that, that I think what can be done within families is, uh, and looking at treatments is to make sure that, that, that the DMD patients have the stand, appropriate standard of care. Because you, right at the end of the day, as I said, we, the, 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 the success rate here, while we hope is increasing, we never know. But what you do know is what you know already based on what the results have given us to date. And, that, and, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because probably 50% or so of patients aren't on steroids. So there's a lot of good care that could be come across even in, while these new therapies and things and while within the system what works and what doesn't work uh, comes to play that I think if people spent also time making sure that the best of care is given, that would be that's I think a really important criteria. I would like to echo that as well, particularly when we look forward into gene therapy. It's a really good point. You know, one of the, the, one of the risks of seeing something as exciting and uh, potentially transformative as our gene therapy, as, as the gene therapy program we have, as, as well as others, you're going to hear from other organizations that are working on gene therapy as well, is that one might imagine they can stand down. And what I would say is that I agree with you completely. Don't, don't do that. I mean, it, you know, our study right now, we have the material to run a 24 patient study with the goal of benefiting everyone. So it's not like we're trying to benefit 24, but don't, you know, please don't get off a current therapy or, or if you're, you and your physician believe a, a therapy is appropriate right now, don't get off of that therapy in the hope that you might get on in, a, in an investigational way a, a, a therapy that's in the, in the pipeline, even one as exciting as gene therapy. In fact, you know, if, you, if you end up believing that gene therapy is potentially transformative, then for all means, you know, protect yourself right now uh, while, while we do our work like mad, not just Sarepta, but Pfizer and Solid, we all do, we all work like mad in an effort to get something as transformative as gene therapy to the community. Don't, don't, don't do, you know, something short term that, 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 you know, isn't doing the best thing for yourselves while you're waiting for a transformative therapy to come about. Do we want to go to this side? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for bringing so much hope to at least 50% of the population that we have out here. My question is for uh, Sarepta. Can you please share your plans for when would we be able to see data from the ASCENSE trial? Because when we started enrolling, we said when we reach 75% with, you know, at 48 weeks, for 75% of the patients, yeah. we'll reconsider placebo period if we have enough good data. Yeah, so, okay. So we're, we are proposing some changes to the Essence program, including eliminating that interim look. And you may wonder why. It's not, it's, it's for a very specific reason. So we are gonna submit for Goladersen at the end of this year for approval. And then, there's, you know, again, we haven't looked yet, but if we look at the biopsies from the Casimirson portion of Essence, and, our, and, and they look as good as the Goladersen, and that's what the, the preclinical work predicts, then we're going to do the same thing for, Go for Casimirson right behind it. And we're going to seek accelerated approval, okay? And we've already talked to the FDA, and they, they're not agreeing that, you know, that we're going we're to definitely get it, but they certainly agree that that's the appropriate pathway for us to submit. And if we are able to get accelerated approval for Golodersin and then Casimirson, it will be essence that is the confirmatory trial. So the good news is we already have the confirmatory trial in place to support the approval, and we don't want to do anything that places that makes Essence any more difficult or places um, you know, any additional burdens on Essence because we want to make sure it's, it's going to act as the confirmatory trial for Essence because if we're, uh, for, uh, for Golodersin and then Casimirsin because if we're, if it all works out brilliantly, we could have an a approval and have everyone ha that has Exxon 53 amenable mutations in the U.S. Um, uh, you know, get the potential for access in the United States next year, and for Casimirson, perhaps, you know, and again, this is a bit speculative because we, we haven't even looked at the biopsies yet, but if it looks like our animal models at least predict it will look, we could do the same thing with Casimirson, perhaps, if not in 2019, right at the beginning of 2020, and so we need to make sure we we're very protective of essence because if we screw up essence, you know, and we, we create any harm there, then the FDA isn't going to be as comfortable giving us accelerated approval. That's what, for instance, people have asked. We, we aren't recruiting, 
We're recruiting in, in Europe right now, we're not recruiting in the US. And people have asked, why are you doing that? Why are you favoring Europe, favoring one region over another? And that isn't the issue. The issue is that in the US, we have to be able to tell the, the um, FDA with confidence that getting an approval in the US isn't gonna screw up Essence. People aren't gonna leave Essence in the US to get on therapy. So we need to stop recruiting in the US for the benefit of the US patients and continue to recruit in Europe for the benefit of the Europe, European patients. Does that make sense? Yeah. And thank you so much for expanding the study and adding more kids to it in the US too before you closed enrollment. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we want to go over to this side? Hi, I'm Veenu Kohli from India. I'm a mother of 3.2-year-old DMD boy. He was diagnosed when he was just 15 months. And since then, I've been trying mailing everyone to take him or recruit him in any of the trials. So uh, the end result is they end up telling me that uh, since you are an Indian citizen, so we need some time. So is it like being an Indian citizen, our kids can't be enrolled? Or if you can extend an arm to India of your trials? Yeah, to set up the official and as well as to the wave uh, official. No, because my son's deletion are 45 to 50. So he's eligible for exam skipping 51. So the, the short answer is there's, there's nothing about being an Indian citizen that by itself would for, foreclose a, a person from being in a study. Um, what is true is that, you know, remember I showed in the early slides, we have really increased our ambition as an organization and so we've gone from kind of zero to 100 miles an hour, and we've got to start getting trial sites up around the world, and that includes in India, and we don't have them now. But I can tell you, and you know, you, Dr. Gilmore, who I think is over there in a pink shirt somewhere, will tell you he is, uh, uh, he is very committed to getting sites up in Asia Pacific and in India and the like. Uh, I can't tell you exactly when it's going to occur, but it's definitely something we're looking at. Um, we are even ready to move to US mm -hmm. to enroll him in the trials. What so if uh, in US, if he's enrolled anywhere like in Sarapta and as our way, because both are mostly working on Exxon, skipping 50 when he's eligible for that. Yeah, I, I can't tell you to do that. <laughs> so, right. I think maybe it's worth also looking at inclusion criteria of what's available. Do they have it down to like one and a one and a half is a pretty you know, in terms of a clinical trial, not a, it, you have to look and see, like we just expanded to two to five year olds, to go even less than two year olds requires other uh, regulatory requirements to be able to make that happen, even for treatments. So it's not only even going to India or here, it's also part the, the, the idea of what sort of uh, safety toxicology studies they've done and what the trials are trying to measure in order to get in. So it's, it's more than just um, being in, in the appropriate location. All right, thank you, thank you. This side. This question is for Wave. Is it on, guys? I think it's on. There we go, just. This question is for Wave. Uh, I applaud you for including non-ambulatory patients in the clinical trials. Can you explain the rationale for cutting off the age at 18? We would love to. <laughs> so we do know that this is definitely an area where we, we, we are focused on. So while we included ambulatory, non-ambulatory, where we have the age ranges right now into up, up to 18, was it definitive of moving into the ad adult studies? And actually, we've had conversations exactly about, I'm looking at Jen now, exactly about that, whether or not, you know, in terms of moving farther up into the adult spectrum, is something that we could consider. Again, it's very similar to the question before that oftentimes, and this is the learnings, you said inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. One, as, as Stu said, just based on, on the safety studies you have going in. The other, on the early end, but definitely on the, on the later end, and as we think about the phase one safety study, where we can be more inclusive, I think we were learning that we, we thought we were getting to the adult population as we were getting up to 18, because this is separate from the efficacy study that would start afterwards. Um, so actually, as of t this morning's conversation, is one of the discussions that we are having around the upper limit of the age range inclusion. So it's a great question. Yeah, and actually, if I can make a comment on that, uh, one of the things you, you may hear as you sort of learn about uh, clinical trials is that it's very important 
in the beginning of a of a pipeline program to limit the the age range because if you in your initial trials if you're not able to show a benefit then you won't be able to take it into um, into the the broader range but the uh, but I would say across the board all of the the drug development that I'm aware of all have a plan to explain to expand it across age ranges um, as, as they move forward so some of it is really just patients unfortunately like not not patient patient you know for non-suspitation for translarna in Europe, where we've done some uh, considerable amount of work looking at non-ambulatory patients. And one of the things that we're doing this year is to try and expand the label to include non-ambulatory patients. Because we've now collected data to show that there was a, 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 a substantial improvement in pulmonary function for, when you compare to natural history. And we're trying to use that now to expand the label so that it would be available to all uh, patients that are that are also lost the ability to to walk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can go to this side. Hi, my name is Laura McLinn, and I'm the mom of a nine-year-old boy with Duchenne. And first of all, I just want to express my gratitude to everyone up here. What an exciting um, session to have and watch this evolve over just the short five years since Jordan's been diagnosed. Um, I have some questions specifically um, about NS Pharma study and the Japanese trial. And first, I, I probably won't use the right scientific words, but hopefully you'll understand my question. Um, the difference between the 40 milligram per kilogram and 80 milligram per kilogram dosing for the US trial, um, it looked like the um, dystrophin that was expressed was about the same on average but the exon skipping seems significantly different for the 80 milligram per kilogram dosing. So my question is, um, what does that mean, first of all, um, in layman's terms? And then what does it mean moving forward as we continue um, dosing boys? Is something going to change with the dosing for the extension trial that's happening right now? So, so you're absolutely right, and, and you picked up exactly on what was observed. So the exon skipping uh, uh, across the 16 participants, eight in each group, looked like it doubled when you doubled the dose. Um, and on an average, the amount of dystrophin produced did not double when you doubled the dose. So then the question becomes, why is that? Um, and I think one of the things that we know is that, you know, all Duchenne is not identical, and all muscle is not identical, and there are um, many things going on in dystrophic muscle that could affect how much how, how dystrophin is expressed from the message, and also how stable that dystrophin is in the muscle. Um, we know from studying Becker muscular dystrophy that uh, that you can have exactly the same in-frame deletion. The most common one in Becker muscular dystrophy is 45 to 47, and have very different amounts of dystrophin protein expressed. Um, and there's been a lot of research going into trying to understand why that is. And one of the reasons is does have to do with the inflammatory milieu within muscle and, and different inflammatory components of our immune systems that then uh, affect, appear to affect how much dystrophin is is produced and remains stable in muscle. So the, there's a lot to learn, but you, you, um, you picked up perfectly on the science. So um, is there a plan moving forward with the extension study on changing the dosing or keeping the first eight still on the 40 and the second eight still on the 80 or? Yeah, so that's all in discussion at, at this time. And as, as many people have, um, have you know, discuss, uh, they're, they're, you know, it's really a collaboration between the sponsor and researchers and the regulatory authorities to kind of figure out the path, the best path forward to get treatments as quickly as possible. Um, so, so there isn't a plan okay. that I can tell you. <laughs> and one just quick question um, for you. Um, I noticed w when the slides were up, um, so the North American study, there is an extension trial going on, so those 16 boys are still on drug, 
And I just want to express my gratitude um, for that. Um, it means a lot to me personally. I would also like to ask, um, I didn't see an extension uh, trial listed for the Japanese boys. I, at this time, uh, this uh, I proposed the Xen study to a, a Nippon CM company, but the uh, company decided not to uh, perform uh, Xen study because of a uh, uh, drug supply problem. Uh, limited, yeah. So that's okay. all. Okay. Yeah. So, Thank you I, very much. I should say that there's um, a plan in both Japan and the U.S. and, and Europe to, to continue these studies, um, so, um, as well as a commitment on the part of NS Pharma to, to keep the, uh, the 16 who were in this original trial on, on drug for the foreseeable future. Are you able to share anything about the plans for the next study to include more boys? No, that's still part of the okay. lots of discussion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have three more people that have questions, and in the interest of time, that's probably all we have time for today. So, Jen. Thanks, guys. You know, as a 20-year veteran in Duchenne, this is amazing, very exciting. I want to ask, ask one quick question of the uh, Exxon Skipping folks, and then one quick comment to Summit. Michelle, thank you for being here. I can't see you now because the camera's in my way, but thank you, and we love you. I just want to note that we're going to have failures. Um, we're going to have, have studies that, that don't indicate a benefit. And as a community, I've been watching, you know, a lot of folks who were upset and who who were disappointed in how they were informed and it was it reminded me of another study that when it ended families didn't know and I understand that there are a lot of reasons why you have to tell shareholders or make a broad announcement but I would just urge all of the companies to have a plan in place when the, when there's a potential piece of information that these families really need to have a one-on-one a, a -on -one discussion with their doctor about what's next for their personal child where their data is um, I have a lot of folks that asked me to, to make that comment. So everybody that's here, if you're developing drugs, plan for what you're going to do for approval and access, but also plan for what you're going to do when things come to an end. Um, our patients are just as important on the day that the study ends as they are on the day that the study enrolls. So I, I wanted to bring that here. And then questions that I'm, I'm asking on behalf of some folks that are listening online. Um, they wanted to know about the PPMO. Uh, Doug, I also can't see you, but I'm asking you. Um, do you have plans to be able to roll folks over from the, uh, from the Exondus or from 53 Essence into a PPMO? Will there always be a, a washout period? And um, is there some sort of way to streamline that as you develop both simultaneously? Hi, Jen. Just wanted to quick thank you for your, your comment, and we certainly hear that. Um, you know, one of the things that we have brought up, actually, just yesterday, I brought it up to, to Ryan, is that, you know, we think that it would be nice to have, at least in the informed consent to the parents, of how we need to communicate results. Um, I know I had had side conversations with some parents in our trial before that, you know, that it wasn't possible for us to get to them ahead of time. Um, but, you know, negative news is, is never easy to hear at any time. You you know, we, do, we did have a plan in place. We executed on that plan. Unfortunately, some people still didn't get, I, you know, we can't control investigators checking their messages or checking their emails and making sure that they're right on top of things. So, you know, things did fall through the crack, cracks. And as I said, you know, we deeply regret that that happened. But I hear you, and I wish we could do better. I think that's a great idea, adding it into the consent. Oh, thanks for the question. So, so as it stands right now, as you know, there's not the ability to wash out and then move over into PPMO 51. This is a single ascending dose study right now, you know, to, to the point that someone made earlier. We've got to be really careful that we don't create some confounding variable that ends up, you know, being the reason that we don't get to move to the next stage that doesn't relate to actually the therapy. I'm not saying that in the future there isn't the possibility of that. I'm also, we don't have it on the plan right now, but then we're really literally in the first few steps of our thousand mile march. We're at a single ascending dose study of, for our first six plus rare platforms. So, so let, let's get a little bit further along in the single ascending dose study and then we'll think a little bit about how we do that. I'm just mirroring your enthusiasm and forward looking. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I, I absolutely understand. Over here. 
Yes. Um, hello, everybody. Jim Wang is my name. I come from China Parents Group. I come here. I don't have question. I just will um, thank you. Uh, I will use this opportunity to, to thank you, Pat, to invite me to join the conference. Uh, conference. Now we have 4,000 parents in China, also with 3,000 patients in China. After 2011, we joined the DMD communication. We already submit one, more than 1,600 patients' data to global patient registration at TreatMD. Now, um, also, I will take the opportunity to thank PTC. We will start the a clinical trail in China end of this year. So we we'll welcome more company to come to China. Um, as the president for uh, Chinese parents, we welcome, we hope more company can start clinical trail and come to our land century country. Thank you, Pat, again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, last question over here. Good morning. Um, now that we have years of open label and clinical data on Adalarin and Exxon DIS-51. What actual publicly accessible evidence is there of real change in clinical outcomes? I'm the father of a 19-year-old. I'm pretty familiar with the natural history. And does it really work is kind of the bottom line. Yeah, yeah so maybe I'll start. We, we've probably done. <laughs> no beating around the bush there, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, the answer is, I mean, the. Well, first, let me just state that the regulators who've done a lot of work in Europe have demonstrated, looked at the risk benefit and said, yes, that it, it works, and therefore allowed it out in, within the general population. I will say that we also have um, a registry of over 260 patients, I think, now that uh, we're studying. We ju we're just publishing uh, the pulmonary function data in terms of improvements. There'll be publications that over time come out and demonstrate its activity as we continue with the registry. So our, our goal is to continue to have additional data that comes out over time that continues to support the benefit risk profile of that. Um, and so that, that's the way we're doing it. I think there's a substantial amount of clinical data that we've obtained, of some of which we've already published, that is actually demonstrating this activity. And then one final follow-up for the Exxon DIS-51. Yeah. Will this real clinical data involving potentially hundreds of patients instead of a couple dozen, yeah. will that assist with the platform approval? I, I think it will. Let, so let's do, I think that, that the real world data is very helpful. We've got to do more than we're doing as an organization. My head of medical affairs over there, Ash, is working like mad uh, with others to support the concept of registries that will um, get us real world data going forward. And I think it's extraordinarily valuable. You know, the, one of the issues we all have, and we hear it over and over again, is you hear it in the questions you're posing, we're creating clinical trials for the purpose of approval, and you have to do it that way. Science requires the, you know, to, to you know, control all the variables and look at only one thing in a very narrow, specific way when we're dealing with a very holistic disease and we're dealing with a very holistic therapy, ones that are restoring dystrophin. But, so we need to get better about real world data. We've got to get better about patient reported outcomes and asking next year about it. I think we'll have a lot better answers on that part of it and what we're doing. Now, on Exxon is 51, type person. Yes, it does work. That's why it's approved. You know, there's, you know, it, it unequivocally, uh, it unequivocally does what it's supposed to do, which it, it's, it um, creates exon skipping, it creates in, it creates in frame um, messenger RNA, and it makes dystrophin. And it's done that every single time in every single patient, and that's a hundred and something patients already. So that's good. Good news. It doesn't make a ton of dystrophin. That's absolutely true. But it, and it's not as transformative as gene therapy, that is unquestionably true. But it provides a milder phenotype uh, for, these, for, for patients that have Exonus 51 and it's beneficial in that regard. It isn't unlike, for instance, Exon 44 amenable 
um, patients. We've recently done biopsies and worked with others on biopsies of exon 44 amenable patients who, um, in a natural but, but a sporadic way, have their own form of exon skipping. It tends to be in the hunt of the kind of dystrophin that uh, Ateplersin makes. And as we know, exon 44 amenable boys have a distinctly milder phenotype, stay out of a wheelchair longer, stay off vents longer, et cetera, versus many of the other um, other mutations, so it works. We are currently working on uh, a publication strategy for the outcome of three studies that we have, all of which looked at declines in pulmonary function and saw significant um, uh, diminution and decline associated with pulmonary function, which, you know, from our perspective, is an extraordinarily important endpoint that we all should be focusing more and more and more on over time. One of the frustrating things that I know the community has and that we share deeply with the community's frustration is that this six minute walk test that continues to be used um, as an endpoint, in, in addition to being you know, a, a difficult endpoint that doesn't relate to anything that people actually do in normal clinics, also robs 60% of the Duchenne muscular dystrophy community from the ability to be in trials and then worse yet still, you know, good, good news not in the U.S. right now, but perhaps in, in other places, it, it makes it more difficult to get therapies to, um, to non-ambulatory patients, even when, in fact, the therapy clearly, if it worked in ambulatory patients, it would be equally beneficial to non-ambulatory patients. Um, and, it, and even when you can get approval, it, requi it, it means that these families have to fight even harder to get on and stay on therapy. So we need to look at better endpoints than some of the endpoints that have been used historically. Thank you. So I'm going to break my rule. I'm going to let Amanda ask one more question. And if you have a question, just come, come up and find afterwards, because we really want to try to stay on track. And after you ask your question, we have to thank this wonderful panel, and then I'll call Ryan up. OK, Great. go, Amanda. No, thank you, Abby. I appreciate that. And Dr. Peltz, I just had one follow-up question about, uh, and I apologize if this is a repeat. I came in late. Is there needle biopsies planned in the next phase of the Adeloran trial, and where does that stand? And my okay. second comment for all of the um, companies is, as we get into the area with multiple trials, and if you find that a therapy is not effective for a certain percentage of the populations, what are you doing to identify the folks where it might not be working out? Yeah. So there's two, two important points to that. One is, in terms of the, um, to, we're doing a dystrophin study. And that's, so as, as I re said before, it's that in, in consultation with the FDA, what we would agree, and I think this was, again, very important, is that it, it sort of wiped off the slate of whatever was said prior to the FDA with a dystrophin study and the clinical data that we currently have. So they, they definitely believe the you know, that this, the drug is clinically efficacious. From a regulatory perspective, they want that. So we're doing a dystrophin study. Uh, I think you've already heard a bit about the needle biopsies where they're far less intrusive uh, and better the use, so we're, we're, we're going to be using those. We anticipate starting that trial by the end of the year so that there'll probably be like a six month and one year time point that then will allow us to have it by the end of next year. It's going to be a relatively small state, a study and that really just as uh, what you've seen, really any amount of dystrophin of a background was, would be sufficient for that. So we're, we're really quite hopeful. We're working very hard on that to, to get that going so that they'll be available as soon as possible for, the, for those in, uh, in the United States. Uh, in term, it, your second question leads to an interesting point about where and where doesn't things work. Um, that's harder than it sounds. For instance, muscle strength tests, right? If you look, above seven uh, years of age, the test is insensitive to be able to monitor that. Uh, the you know, six minute walk test is good for patients above 300 and have a certain amount of strength. So it, often what you're, you're trying to do is try and figure out, the, the goal of drug development isn't to say where it doesn't work in a way, it's to, to get it approved in the patient population to demonstrate clinical efficacy, right? And so we spend, and you hear a lot of time talking about clinical endpoints, and ultimately really what you're trying to do is find what's the best endpoint that demonstrates benefit. But we all know now that when you're looking at disorders, there's those that are early, middle, and late. 
And no one endpoint really covers the spectrum of all of those. So that's why you see why people say we may do, we, we've done non-ambulatory work, we've done early kid work, we've done the, where the kids are right in the middle, right? So um, that's what you're ultimately trying, you're never trying to say it doesn't work in one space, you're trying to find out where's the best place to demonstrate activity. And then in, you, know, you have to think about this as a rare disorder space where there's not a large number of patients. And the FDA is, from a regulatory perspective, very willing to extrapolate beyond that. Because especially if you think about dystrophin replacement therapies, the notion of, of, of dystrophin replacement should be beneficial. That's probably going to be true. I mean, if you think about it, what we've done in, say, the non, in the pulmonary function took far more years to figure this out. If you think about steroids within themselves, it was a 10-year process to really be unequivocally true that it's better, it's right, it's really an inflammatory disease, it, but it took a long time. So I think what you really want everyone to do is really spend their time trying to figure this out in the shortest period of time using an assay. So that's a long-winded way of saying that the way to work on this is to try and figure out where you could demonstrate benefit. And then often, if it makes sense, if you're replacing dystrophy, even if you're not measuring six-minute walk tech, if you're really replacing dystrophy and it's going into the lung, it should benefit those kids. And then you need a registry to prove that out in the long run. Right. Okay. We, we have one more little comment. I think it's a, the last which pick, which piggybacks a little bit, because we do talk about assays, and there's a component around getting companies, all of us, to kind of work together in some aspects where if we talked about dystrophin and Western blotting, we could say that each company could have their own approach to trying to see whether or not you see dystrophin expression based on Western blots. And some of the challenges we give to regulators and give to patients as data comes out is variability across assays, depending on who's using what and how you can actually relate that to your point of knowing is it working or not working. And I think there's pre-competitive opportunities that are just around how do we get standardization across various assays? How do we talk about things with similar ways? What's Western blot, what's protein? What's transcript because it's a PCR, because it's message? and trying to kind of create where we can, can clarity and standardization and harmonization in ways so that we can better compare approaches, doses in a way that's, you know, a company independent and hopefully helpful not just to patients, but to regulators and everyone else as well who's trying to compare opportunities. So great. It's Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great. Thanks very much to this tremendous panel. And uh, we have some quick polling questions from Ryan and then you get a break. But be back here at 11.30 for the gene therapy panel. Okay, so obviously we have the, uh, the panel on gene therapy next, and we're gonna run through two quick questions, and then there's gonna be just a couple of minute break. There's no coffee outside, so we won't lose you for 20 minutes, but um, we just suggest you stretch a little and then we'll start that panel on time, which I know everyone's anxious to, uh, uh, to listen to and ask questions of. Okay, let's get the next polling question up. This is for everybody to answer. We are interested uh, in your thoughts around when you believe gene therapy could be approved by the FDA. So based on what you know, when do you believe gene therapy will be approved by the FDA as a treatment for Duchenne? Let me give this a bit of time. We thought it would be good to do this before the gene therapy panel. <laughs> Let's give it 20 more seconds. We see the top responses being either five years or two years. Now, following this, I'm going to look at the data and actually stratify it by who you are and who made those choices and what parents believed, what clinicians, what industry, and we'll be able to report that back tomorrow. The software doesn't allow us to do the stratification right now. Okay, so we can move on to the second question before we do the quick break. Now, based on what you know, when do you believe CRISPR-Cas9 or gene editing 
will be approved by the FDA as a treatment for a Duchenne. And again, answer based just on your own opinion. There's no right or wrong answers. No one's going to see who choose, chose what. We're just interested in your perception of the timelines. So we see a little longer with some of the choices, the majority of the choices here. Still five year period was a popular choice. These are still trickling in and you can actually still answer them for the next 20 seconds. Those online as well. Looks like it's slowing down a bit. Okay. Oh, <laughs> looks like five years is, is making a run for it. <laughs> so, um, okay. Looks like it's settling. Late comers. Okay, so take a couple of minutes to stretch, go outside, but we are going to promptly start at 1130, so come back in for the gene therapy panel. Thank you. Okay.